series. Hi, everyone. My name is Beth Johnston. I'm the Chief Community Engagement Officer here at the FSHD Society. And to, together here with um, Jamshid Arjamand, our Chief Science Officer, and Dr. Tassin Mozafar um, from the University of California, Irvine, we welcome you here today to FSHD University. Um, just quickly, for those of you who don't know us, the FSHD Society is the world's largest research-focused patient advocacy organization. Whew, that is a mouthful. And we are focused solely on FSHD. Our mission, of course, is to find treatments and a cure for FSHD while we empower our families. Um, we host these and so many other events to give you our families an arsenal of knowledge so you can be your own best advocate when it comes to your care. Um, and of course, empower you to better understand research and the role that you play in accelerating therapy development. So today from our research department, we welcome Dr. Tassin Mozafar. He is the chair of neurology at the University of California in Irvine. Um, and we will be doing a Q&A session today with him all about clinical trials. But I wanna just mention the timing of this session is very critical for a couple of reasons. First, we are currently working with over a dozen pharmaceuticals that have therapies in development for FSHD, several of which are scheduled to go into clinical trials at the end of this year and the beginning of next. So the more you know about the process of clinical trials and how it works, the better. And second, we are preparing for Fulcrum Therapeutics to announce the results of their phase 2B clinical trial of lasmapamod, say that fast three times, lasmapamod. <laughs> that's a treatment for FSHD that's intended to stop the expression of the DUX4 gene and to slow the progression of symptoms. They will be announcing the results next Thursday morning, June 24th via a press release and then sharing their detailed data later on at our very own 28th Annual International Research Congress. Fulcrum will then be presenting their findings to our community later that afternoon via a special webinar. So please look for a special invitation in your email box tomorrow to register for that webinar. It is a limited number capacity, um, so you must register for that webinar. So in advance of all this happening, we wanted to give you a good solid foundation of clinical trials and kind of how that works. So um, Dr. Mozafar, would you just like to introduce yourself quickly and what your role is with um, clinical trials there at UC Irvine? Sure, um, and, and good morning uh, from California at least. I'm, I'm sure it's afternoon in the rest of the world um, on that. So I, I apologize, I did not get a chance to make slides in advance, but let me see if I can I can wing it without slides um, on that. I'm a practicing neuromuscular neurologist, although my administrative roles keep increasing, so I'm not seeing as many patients as I used to before. But I'm a neurologist. I trained at Washington University in St. Louis in, neuromus in neurology as well as in neuromuscular disorders with Dr. Pestron. Um, and I've been at Irvine for 21 years, uh, leading the neuromuscular division um, since then. Um, and as part of this, we built up a very, very robust neuromuscular trial infrastructure. So at any given point between the four of us who are neuromuscular physicians, we run anywhere from 25 to 30 clinical trials. Most of them are phase two and phase three trials, but some of them are phase one trials. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll explain a little bit about what the differences between these trials are, um, and then how do normally trials run? And I, I don't wanna take up a lot of time, but I think as you head into next week and listen to Fulcrum's discussion, I think it would be important to know what the steps are um, and what the requirements are from an FDA point of view. Um, so generally, um, when we do clinical trials, we are testing drugs that are either not on the market yet, um, so they are only available through a research study, or they are on the market for another indication. Um, so they may be approved for, let's say, multiple sclerosis, or they may be stroke, uh, uh, approved for stroke or some other non-neurological condition, but they're being tried for the first time in a, a disease um, such as FSH. So for instance, Fulcrum's drug is a completely new drug. It's never been tried in any other disease before. So this is gonna be a first um, trial of it. And, and sometimes they are what's called first in human trials, which means that the only disease population that they have been looked at or the only human population they've been looked at are disease populations. So generally phase one trials are the earliest stages of the trial. Phase one are mainly to see if 
patients, either normal individuals or patients with disease will tolerate the drug. Okay, so that's an important discussion. So a lot of the drugs are tried in animal models or cell models first. Um, so in, in culture dish models or, or, or rats and mice, and then they are taken to human studies. So the first phase is usually making sure that they are safe and they don't create a lot of problems. But the, the purpose of the phase one is also to determine what's called pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics, which means that when you give a drug, do you get a steady level in the blood? Uh, and more importantly, that is the drug doing what it's supposed to do, which means to engage um, the target that it's supposed to take. So there is a lot of blood that's taken. There's a lot of, sometimes you do muscle biopsy, sometimes you do MRIs, et cetera, but you really want to prove that there is target engagement um, of that uh, drug. And then they are taken to phase two. Phase two is usually a dose ranging study. So safety, um, primarily done for safety and tolerability, but also to find the optimal dose that can be tried for what's um, called a pivotal phase of the study, which is the next phase of the study or phase three on that. So usually the phase two studies are smaller. Um, they're done in a smaller number of patients, but the primary purpose is to figure out what the optimal, do what the optimal dose would be um, and then that dose is taken to the next phase of the study, which is phase three, which is a efficacy study. So that's where they really want to prove the drug is effective in doing what it's supposed to do, which is to either slow down the disease, cure the disease, um, or not have an effect at all. Um, oftentimes, as I mentioned, these studies are informed by biomarkers. So biomarkers are surrogate markers of of disease process that are looked at um, to give additional information on whether the drug is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So for instance, in multiple sclerosis, MRI of the brain has become a huge biomarker because you can actually look at disease burden and you can look at disease process by means of MRI. Now, unfortunately in neuromuscular diseases, we don't have, at, at least at this point, uh, a MRI-based biomarker, although a number of studies are using MRI of the muscle, especially fat uh, replacement. In the fulcrum study, there were MRIs done, um, which were very high-quality MRIs and looking at very quantitative measures of muscle, fat, etc. But there's also a muscle biopsy component in the fulcrum study, which was looking at target engagement. So whether looking at whether it was doing what it's supposed to do, which is to reduce the DUX4 level of the protein in the muscle. And that's why the disease, I mean, the drug, uh, the study was called Redux, because we want to really reduce the DUX4 expression in the muscle. In that. So again, so when you look at um, the clinical trial result, and that's what Fulcrum is going to be presenting next week, they're going to talk about primary outcome measures. So um, before they start the trial, they have to tell the FDA, which is the Federal Drug Administration, what parameters they're going to be looking at. So they have to declare in advance in writing what would be the primary or the number one objective and what would be the secondary goals of the study. Okay, So that that's cannot be arbitrary. That cannot be after the, after the fact. They actually have to declare it up front. Um, so that's why it's important to, to carefully choose your primary measures because you don't want to out, uh, choose a pri primary outcome measure that's not likely to be sensitive or work on that. So they, they will declare at the primary outcome measure and then they will show you data on what happened to the primary outcome measure, what happened to the secondary outcome measures. And oftentimes these phase two studies have exploratory outcome measures which are of interest, but they don't necessarily make or break the studies. Uh, but in, in definitely inform us for the next phase of the study, which is the phase three studies. In that. So that's in short is what clinical trials are um, on that. There is a, for rare diseases and ultra rare diseases, the FDA usually requires only one phase three study. Sometimes, especially if the phase two data is really, really strong, they may actually consider that in itself and give a conditional approval. But oftentimes, they really do require a pivotal, what's called a pivotal phase three study. But unlike more common diseases like high blood pressure or diabetes, or even I would say Alzheimer's disease, which is relatively common, you don't need to 
do two separate studies. You need, if you have good well, one good well done study, then a, a single phase three study can lead to the approval of the drug if the data is really good. All right. So, th so that's what you're going to be looking for when when Fulcrum presents the data next week. Very good. Um, I know recently um, we all probably heard that um, Fulcrum received a fast track designation um, from the FDA. Can you explain what that means? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I, I may not be completely um, exhaustive about it, but um, fast track is usually designated for drugs that are looking into rare or ultra rare diseases which means that the fast track, um, if the, co the company is given the assurance that if they do a well-designed scientific study in a rare disease, that single study may be enough to get approval for the drug. So this is only relevant to rare or often diseases um, on that, and FSH obviously falls into that category. And, and Jamshid may have more, uh, more experience with this than I have, so. I, I don't actually, that's why you're here presenting for us, but thank you very much. I actually going back to the phases of the clinical trial, um, um, I had some questions, I think uh, maybe, um, is it fair to say maybe that uh, each phase of the clinical trial is actually an experiment? Uh, and as much as the, um, the sponsor, the drug sponsor has a hypothesis, and uh, they do this and trying to set up a, a ver a, as well a controlled of an experiment as possible with patients. Is that a fair assessment? Let's say, for instance, in a phase one, uh, the hypothesis being that the drug uh, is safe uh, in patients and you are testing it at a particular dose and you are looking for adverse effects um, as your endpoint. And so you have to clarify all of that with the regulatory agencies ahead of time, uh, that that's, you're going to be measuring and looking for adverse effects. Is that a fair? And that's absolutely correct. So again, um, it's like any experiment that you do in a laboratory. Um, um, it's, there, is, there has to be a hypothesis. Um, and what you're doing is you're testing your hypothesis um, in that situation. So um, so for, as Jamshid mentioned, the, the hypothesis in phase one would be that the drug is safe in either healthy volunteers or, or in the disease population, because it's important that, that we also do it in a disease population, because sometimes they would react differently than a healthy, healthy younger individual do on that. Phase two, the hypothesis is that you will find a particular drug dose that is um, well tolerated and safe, and yet has a advantage over the other doses. Um, and, and that's the dose that then they would wanna to take to the next level, which is to prove the efficacy. But all of these are experiments, and these were, that's why these research studies are experimental studies. They're, nothing is guaranteed. We, don't, we can't upfront guarantee you that the treatment is gonna work. Okay, yes. all bets are off, right? Yeah. Um, but and and it's a risk in some sense because there may be side effects, and it's possible, and we've seen this in other diseases, that the drug may actually cause more harm than good. So that's why it's done in a controlled setting. Uh, it is done with a certain amount of safety that is built into the study. Um, so there is frequent visits to do a physical examination. There are frequent visits to do muscle, mus muscle testing, but also there are blood work that is done on a frequent enough basis to make sure that we're not causing problems with low blood counts or high blood counts. We're not causing problems with the biochemistry in the blood. Well, we're not, and, and there is a very detailed um, in input from the patient on whether they're having any side effects, whether they are experiencing stomach pain, whether they're experiencing chest pain, whether they're experiencing nausea, vomiting, et cetera. So all of these are done. And that's why it's, it's if, if you were to try an untested drug, the best way to do it would be to do in a controlled clinical trial. The other factor that is um, always um, <clears throat> important to consider is that you want to test it against a placebo. A placebo TIVO is an inert subject uh, material. So those are usually what I would call sugar pills um, on that. Because um, the, uh, somebody who's given a drug and told that this drug may help them 
with this disease process, there is a significant psychological effect of the drug as well. And patient may feel better and patient may feel stronger. That doesn't necessarily mean that the drug is working in that. So that's why it's important to always compare the results of the drug against a inert subject, uh, inert material or a sugar pill that actually has no direct effect on the drug. Okay. So all clinical trials for that reason, especially the phase three clinical trials, the um, pivotal trials are always done with a placebo um, because you want to make sure that the benefit that you're seeing is real. It's not um, driven by the uh, psychological effects of, on the patient um, because they're trying something and they're hopeful that this uh, treatment would work. Um, and some diseases, like for instance, in myasthenia gravis, which is a, a neuromuscular disorder, the placebo effect is almost as high as 30 to 40%, which means 40% of the patient who are taking placebo actually feel stronger and actually are stronger. Um, but it's, again, it really depends on how stringent your criteria is. Um, so again, really looking at what you think. So it's, it's very, very important. And, and it's, again, a lot of patients don't like taking placebo. They don't like getting assigned to the placebo arm. Uh, but it, that, that's the importance of it. That's why we want to do it against a placebo rather than doing it what we call open label, where the patient knows what they're taking. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that experiment, uh, for, for that explanation. Another question that comes up quite frequently is um, deals with exclusion inclusion criteria. And um, we have a lot of families that are wondering, well, you know, I want to volunteer for the study, but um, I was told that I can't qualify for it. Could you maybe expand on uh, how that relates to the experimental uh, setup and trying to maybe control um, and have a uniform population uh, in a study, um, maybe how that relates to, as well as the outcome measure, uh, if a drug is approved, does that limit the approval if uh, the inclusion criteria was maybe too restricted at the onset of a trial? So I, th I think there's a difference between what is studied in the clinical trial versus what the reality is once the drug gets approved, okay? So again, for instance, if you look at the previous examples from Pompe disease, or if you look at the more recent examples from Lou Gehrig's disease, um, the study um, may uh, the study may take patients very narrow range um, of disease, um, and the reason we do that is we want to, as as Jamshid mentioned, we want to make sure that we take a very homogeneous group. So for, so for instance, most studies. Uh, in neuromuscular disorders will take relatively a new onset disease because you want to make sure that there, there is still some reversibility in the disease, um, that the muscles are going to respond to the drug um, as opposed to patients who had disease for 20, 30 years where most of the muscles may have converted into fat. So that's, that's why they want to take relatively more functional younger, or not younger necessarily, but patients who have less disease duration um, on that um, thing. Um, and, and, and a lot of these studies will take patients who are still able to walk or ambulate on their own rather than um, patients who are requiring um, assistive devices to walk because a lot of the outcome measures are gonna be physical measurements, ability to walk a certain distance, ability to get up from a chair and walk um, six feet. Um, ability to be able to give muscle strength testing, et cetera, on that. So, so the, the clinical trials are done in a narrower set of patients where you have um, a predefined eligibility criteria, okay? So they have to have the disease. The disease has to be confirmed by genetic testing, um, and they have to have a disease duration of a certain period, and they have to be able to ambulate um, or a a certain uh, distance. And more importantly, they don't have significant other medical conditions that will limit the use of the drug, right? But if the drug gets approved, then it's available by prescription, okay? And now it's between you and your physician um, and the physician may choose to write that prescription even if the person did not meet what would have been the eligibility criteria in the clinical trial. Okay, so that's the, and that's where um, I think it's, there is an art of medicine versus a science of medicine, right? 
So again, if you look at the example of um, um, the, the pompe drug, Lumizyme. So Lumizyme originally was only studied in the childhood version of the disease. When, when, when the drug got approved in 2006, it actually got approved for all forms of Pompe disease, not just the infantile version of it. If you take an example of the uh, new uh, Lugerix drug, um, um, uh, Radikawa, Radikawa was only studied in Japan in a very narrow set of patients with Lugerix disease. But yet when FDA approved it, FDA approved it in all forms of ALS, not just that particular form. So it's one, it's dependent on the um, FDA. Um, spinal muscular atrophy is another example. Spinal muscular atrophy, if you look at mucinersin, mucinersin was only studied in type one and type two, which is very severe form of SMA. But the approval by the FDA was in all forms of SMA, um, uh, so not just type one and type two. So again, really depends on what the FDA label is gonna be. Uh, whether they approve it for all forms or just a very restrictive um, version of the disease. But in the end, it's up to the physician. The physician may choose to write the prescription. Um, and if the insurance approves it, patients can have it. So for instance, if a patient was not able to ambulate and was not eligible for the trial, but if the drug is approved for all forms of FSH, the physician may write it for individuals who are, who are not able to ambulate. So I think that's that's an important. I, I don't know if I answered your question or not, Jabshi, but you did. Yeah, I think that the message that I got from this is that even if um, the trial um, may be more restrictive and enroll a narrow segment of the patient population, uh, based on the results and the regulatory oversight, it will generally, if approved, if it's shown to be effective in that narrow range, it can then be approved and available to the broader patient community. Absolutely. Which is important. And so just I'm trying to tie this to the experimental paradigm of the clinical trial. And I think that's why I was asking those leading questions is it's an experiment. You're trying to control uh, uh, the, all the as many parameters as possible in an experiment. Um, but then hopefully the positive results are then uh, benefited by the whole community. Absolutely. Great. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm uh, seeing some questions that seem to be related to uh, the ongoing discussion. So um, if that's okay, uh, yeah. we'll take some questions from the audience. One uh, person was asking, following up on your previous uh, answers, what fraction of a study population is given placebo? Um, so it really depends on the study um, and every study is, diff is different. So there is a significant num uh, a number of deliberations that are made, which are statistical calculations. Most studies, um, especially if they're doing a single dose, will do a one-to-one -one placebo to active drug, which is 50% will get placebo, 50% will get the, uh, the active um, um, drug. Now, if there are two doses that are being studied, then, then they may be two to one. So that means that the patients, uh, one third of the patient will get placebo, one third will get the higher dose, one third will get the lower dose. <clears throat> but and uh, again, the uh, patients, uh, the, some of the studies are being created. So for instance, there are more recent studies in Lugerix disease where um, um, they are um, doing sequential uh, testing of drugs where the placebo rate is not higher than 20%, which means only one fifth of the patients are getting placebo. The other um, four fifths are given different drugs. Um, so, and, uh, so again, there are intelligent designs. There are creative designs where you're trying to minimize the number of placebo patients and yet not lose the fact that the placebo may have a significant effect on the, the outcome of the study. Um, could you expand maybe on a clinical trial design and maybe crossover studies um, or um, open label after a study period has ended, which I think is what the Los Mapama trial uh, has been doing and uh, the open label at the end? Yes. Could you... so, um, so pretty much all um, studies, especially the phase, phase two studies and the phase three studies, this is not relevant to phase one. Uh, but the phase two and phase three are what's um, 
So the, the way they are designed is that there is a randomized part to the study. <clears throat> randomized is like flipping a, a coin. So the patients get assigned to either the active drug or the placebo, okay? And that is done for a defined period of time. So it could be six months, it could be one year, depending on the study and what the rate of progression of the study or disease is. So if the disease is really, really fast progressing, so, um, for instance, let's say headache trials, headache trials, you can get away with three months of study uh, act in a randomized way. But in a slowly progressive disease, which most of the muscular dystrophies are, then the period could be six months, nine months, or a year. Um, and you want to test a active drug against a placebo. Now, a lot of the study designs, um, especially in, um, in uh, inflammatory disorders, but other diseases, there's something called a crossover that Jim Shee was referring to. So in your crossover is, you let's say that you are given a active drug and then the other part has a placebo drug. Then once that first phase of the study is completed, you give them a, a four weeks of washouts where this drug gets out of your system. And then you crossed over to another randomized phase um, and you crossed over to the other option. So if you were taking active, you're gonna be crossed over to the placebo. If you were taking the placebo, you're going to be crossed over to the active arm. So a lot of the, for instance, the drug trials in myasthenia gravis use that, where you want to make sure that the effect is really real. Okay. So this is an additional um, component to it. So you, let's say that the patients who are doing really well in the active will get crossover to placebo, and presumably they will not have as much of an effect on it, whereas the patients who are taking placebo will get crossed over to active and see if they respond and what is the latency of response um, on that. Um, and then at the end of the randomized phase, everyone gets put on the real drug, okay? Which is what um, Jim Shee was referring to as an open label, um, okay? So that is one of the advantages, especially in drugs that are not available on the market. Um, you are now getting access to it for free um, for for an op open label part of the study, which is where you're getting the real drug, but you're still being studied for safety. You're still being studied for side effects and any potential uh, adverse event that may happen during that. Yeah. Depending on <clears throat> the company or depending on whether it's phase two or phase three, um, especially in phase three, if it's a rare disease and it's um, you only need one phase three, Oftentimes the open label will actually continue till the drug gets either a yes or a no from the FDA, um, especially if it showed benefit. <clears throat> so you can be on it for a year or a year and a half or two years, whatever time it takes for the FDA to render a decision on whether the drug can be approved or not. Well, that's, that's good news, thank you. Um, related to adverse effects, there's a question here that um, what happens um, uh, how does the clinical trial team deal with uh, adverse effects and what happens with the population that's participating in a study? So um, again, depending, um, so the patients get um, examined or patient gets uh, inquired um, almost on a monthly basis, but sometimes even more frequent than that. Um, and when, when the investigator learns about a potential side effect, <clears throat> that um, that the patient is experiencing, they, we have to make um, uh, three determinations. One, is it a serious side effect um, or life-threatening side effect versus this is a minor side effect that can be handled and it does not potentially uh, put patient at risk. Number two, the relationship of the disease uh, to, the, to the process. So is this likely to be related to the study drug or the study procedures, or is it a chance occurrence? Okay, so if somebody is a has a history of migraine and gets a bad migraine during a drug trial, is that a drug related or study procedure related side effect, or is that just happened to be the patient just manifested migraine during this the process of the trial? Okay, um, usually if the patient gets to, uh, admitted to the hospital. If the patient um, is admitted to the hospital at least for 24 hours, um, if they requires surgery or 
or it unfortunately dies from the study, then that's obviously a very serious side effect and that has to be reported to the FDA, that has to be reported to the sponsors on that. But majority of the time, most of the adverse events are minor and the investigator will have to decide whether it's, my, it's a minor uh, or a non-serious adverse event versus a serious adverse event, whether it's causally related to the drug or the study procedures or not, whether it requires any intervention. And then the ultimate question that comes up is, if it is determined to be related to the study or study procedures, do we now need to stop the study drug or the study procedure? And if that stoppage is gonna be transient, okay? So sometimes um, we may come into issues where patients blood counts may drop or patients liver enzymes may go up and you hold the drug for a week and it comes back to normal and you can re-challenge the patient. Or sometimes it results in permanent discontinuation of the drug if the side effect is serious. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why it's, it's important to constantly monitor these results. Um, we have to, as an investigator, every time I take on a study, I have to sign an assurance to the FDA that I will be looking at these um, on a real-time basis. Uh, we have to respond to side effects within uh, 24 hours to 48 hours. We have to report serious adverse events within 48 hours to our local ethics board, as well as to the sponsor on that. Um, and then we have to sign off on all the lab results, all the EKGs or everything else that we do. Um, the, it, it, there is a significant responsibility that the investigators are taking on. Great. Um, following up on your previous answer on the open label, um, there was, I think, an announcement uh, of expanded access um, uh, by Fulcrum. Could you explain what expanded access is and how that differs from open label in a trial? Um, okay, I'll try it. Um, again, expanded access rules are different in, in states and there is a difference between the federal rules versus the uh, state rules on that. And, and I think sometimes the state rules trump the federal rules on that. But expanded access is for diseases that where there is a, a treatment is not available. If there is a drug that is showing promise, the patients may, uh, or patient's physician may request access to that drug from the company. Um, and the, the company will um, provide the drug on that. It still has to be done um, in a regulated scientific fashion. They still have to go through ethic boards, uh, ethics board approval. Um, and there, there is an application process. There is a fair amount of paperwork that's involved um, on that. Um, uh, so, so there is um, a process to it. And sometimes the process may take a few weeks to a few months on that. Uh, but it is at least an option available for the patients to be able to access the drug um, and be able to get the drug. So again, it's used a lot in cancer studies. I mean, at our institution, uh, most of the expanded access uh, protocols are usually in cancer studies where these, there is no other cure or they have not responded to standard treatment, but it is an option available for other neuromuscular, neurological disorders as well um, on that. So if, if Fulcrum is um, allowing expanded access would be patients who were not part of the trial or patients who are not currently in the trial and not on the open label study may be able to potentially request their individual physicians um, to request expanded access from the company. Great. Now, tied into this, there's a question that came in is um, if Lusmapavant gets approved uh, in, by the FDA or possibly if during that transition period when the FDA is reviewing the results uh, and of phase two and before a phase three trial begins if needed, um, what happens in other countries, in European countries? Are the rules different? Would expanded access be available in European countries, let's say, or uh, Australia or Japan? So I, I, do, I don't know the answer to that um, in terms of the legality or the rules um, business. Um, uh, and, and there are some hesitation, especially in some countries, um, there are rules, um, especially, for instance, in Latin America, the rule is if the patient is participating in the drug trial, they have to be given the drug for free for the rest 
for the rest of the thing. And a lot of the companies are hesitant about this as well. Um, my understanding is in Europe, the rules are very similar to what in North America is, um, but it is a, a different environment in, in Europe. They have a different regulatory agency uh, on that. Uh, but a lot of these studies are done in North America and, and a number of European countries. Um, but I, I actually don't know the, and the environment uh, enough to know the specific rules about that. Um, and, then, and then I, I do want to um, do make an editorial comment. Um, I, again, I'm, I'm looking forward to the fulcrum data um, uh, next week, um, but knowing from my experience in, this, in the field, it is incredibly unlikely that the drug may get approved purely on the basis of a phase two study. I mean, unless the phase two is a, a home run or really they hit it out of the ballpark, um, it is gonna be a difficult um, decision for the FDA to make a determination. I mean, they may give a condition approval, but they may not necessarily get full approval. And there is a very strong likelihood that there will be a phase three study, which is the pivotal study. Um, so. So I, I just want to temper that expectation a little bit. Um, I, I think it's going to be a major, major advance um, on that, but we may not be at the stage where it's going to get full approval yet um, on that. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. Um, I think it's important to also maybe highlight that um, no matter what the outcome of that trial is, there's a lot of very important findings that have emerged just by running a trial. As you yeah. had mentioned uh, in your initial statement, uh, uh, very uh, high quality imaging, uh, as well as the biopsy and looking for uh, the biomarker, those have been really amazing advances that had not really been done in the clinical setting uh, or trial setting before. So I think that's uh, those are tools and results that I think are gonna benefit all of the other uh, trials that are going to enter the field pretty soon. No, I mean, and, and I, I, I want to say that, I mean, I've, I've been doing this for 25 years plus um, on that. It, it is an incredibly exciting time for genetically inherited neuromuscular disorders, where previously we didn't have any treatment options. But just look at the number of therapies that are ongoing for inherited muscle disorders. I mean, this is really exciting. And FSHD which is more common than some of the other muscular dystrophies, um, we, for the longest time, we really didn't fully understand what the gene uh, product did. But now that we understand what the role of DUX4 is, and um, I think this is, we're gonna see a lot of treatments coming down the pipeline, whether they're gonna be addressing the DUX4 story directly, whether they're gonna be looking at other options of the thing. But I think it's an, it's an incredibly exciting time at this point. Yes. Um... So the couple of questions that are coming in, um, one was a very practical one is uh, how many, how much muscle is taken in a biopsy? Um, um, I don't know if you can, if there's a general amount uh, in needle biopsies versus open biopsies, maybe you can describe the difference. And if I, if I remember correctly, um, this is an open biopsy for the fulcrum study. I don't think it's a needle biopsy. But even the open biopsy is no more than 300 milligrams of tissue. So it's a very small contact. Um, the, the scar is usually no more than one inch long um, on that. And it heals within five to seven days. Um, so even in patients who have muscle uh, weakness, you're really not doing any harm to the patient with that muscle biopsy. Um, on that, but the amount of tissue is still relatively small. You're, you're talking about 300 milligrams of tissue, which is, which is pretty small on that. But a lot of the studies are also doing needle biopsies. I've, I've been doing a lot of needle biopsies for another limb girdle muscular dystrophy study that we are doing. And these patients are undergoing two biopsies over a period of six months. And that one, I don't even have to cut into the skin. It's actually a needle that I uh, put into the muscle and take a piece, gets done within five minutes without much anesthesia. So the needle biopsy is actually has undergone a major refinement where you can get, depending on the need you have. I mean, if you only need muscle for quick 
biochemical and, and molecular testing, you don't need a lot of tissue. Uh, a lot of, lot of muscle is needed when you're looking at um, morphological changes in the muscle. Okay? But if you're only looking for DNA studies or RNA studies, then you can get away with as little as 30 milligrams of tissue, which you can get from a needle biopsy. All right. So, uh, and again, especially in FSH, I know that in FSH and, and through the work um, of folks like Catherine Wagner and, and Steve Tapscott, there has been a lot of experience with doing needle biopsies um, um, and get very good amount of tissue with least amount of trauma to the patient. Yes. And, and ideally, if these could be translated into a blood-based biomarker where you can get an assessment of the drug's effectiveness in the blood, that would be even more desirable. I mean, and, and that's the holy grail. I mean, we yeah. always want to look for a non-invasive biomarker, so whether it's MRI, okay? And um, so MRI can actually, uh, which is, doesn't require any invasion of the body surface, or if we can find a blood marker that correlates well with the muscle changes, then that would be the ideal situation. So again, uh, unfortunately, DUX4 doesn't behave very well in the blood, but let's say if you can find a blood marker that correlates well with the muscle marker, then I think that would be ideal. In some diseases, the muscle enzyme CK can be used as a, as a disease marker. So myositis, which is inflammation of the muscle, um, your CK levels are very important because that tells you what's happening with the, the muscle. Okay. In FSH, we, you may still need a muscle tissue, but if the MRIs become sensitive enough, then you may not need that. Great, thank you. There's a question here that I actually, I, I wanted to ask you, but I didn't know if, uh, if, if this is something that you might be able to answer, but it, since it popped up by one of our participants I wanted to bring up is uh, recently there was a Biogen's uh, Alzheimer's drug was approved uh, through the accelerated approval and there were some controversies um, in the news about the approval process. And um, could you maybe, if you're familiar with the, the case, kind of explain uh, what the accelerated approval, how it worked, what the controversies were, and uh, maybe how that could be related to FSHD clinical trials, if something similar would happen. So, um, it, so the the controversy in that particular biogen drug is that when you look at the scientific data as to uh, whether the drug really um, benefited in uh, uh, the patient in terms of the predeclared objective measures. So remember, I said that you have to declare what uh, measures you're gonna be doing in the study, and you have to declare what is primary, what is secondary, and you have to show a improvement in those measures compared to placebo. My understanding is that the, the, the drug actually did not show any benefit on any of the measures on that. But there was a notion, um, and that was propagated by the Alzheimer's Association as well, that the caregivers of these patients found it easy to take care of the patients. So they felt that the patients were benefiting from it, okay? The scientific advisory board that the FDA had um, uh, contracted with, um, and these were very qualified um, physicians, scientists who are very experienced with clinical trials, but really know the subject matter, did not find the data from the study compelling. The, the one study was completely negative. The other study had some positive results, but it was not enough to justify approval. So they uniformly and unanimously voted twice on it and voted against the approval of the study. But there was a significant public pressure. Uh, there was a, um, a pressure from the patient population as well as the caregiver groups as well. Um, and the FDA um, decided to approve the drug based on that. Um, on that. And as, as you probably heard, that they, it led to the resignation of some of the key members uh, of that scientific advisory board as well. This has happened before. This has happened usually in diseases where there's a large disease burden um, and there is a desperation because there's no treatment available. So it happened in the 80s with HIV. Uh, where there were some of the HIV drugs were approved because the patients felt they were benefiting, although the scientific data was not that strong. 
Um, it happened more recently in ALS uh, and Lou Gehrig's disease, where they, again, they, it's a desperate disease, it's a fatal disease. Um, so any even small benefit may potentially be major on that. And obviously Alzheimer's where there's a huge disease burden, um, it's obviously, it's, an, it's a huge unmet need. Um, and so if the patients feel that the drug is doing something that needs to be considered, but the challenge in this particular biogen drug is that it's not without side effects. So first of all, it's incredibly expensive. It's an infusion. So the patient and patients cannot be infused at home. Uh, because there are serious side effects. There are side effects of brain swelling, uh, and the patient can potentially be harmed quite, quite significantly with this brain swelling. So the patients have to be infused in a hospital setting or a clinic setting, which means that you have to transport these patients from their home environment to this um, external environment um, on that. Um, there is a significant cost um, to this drug and there are significant side effects from it. So that's why this, the medical and scientific community in generally, in general felt that this was a bad idea to approve this drug. But as I said, there was a overwhelming pressure from the patient communities, et cetera. Uh, that. Um, I, I'm not sure that that necessarily would happen in FSH um, on that, um, but uh, it, it's always possible. Um, and, the, and the FDA increasingly has been convening patient um, support group um, uh, input as well. So they will actually get input from patient organization, from individual patient um, stakeholders as well. Um, so previously where FDA did it in isolation, now increasingly they are listening to patients and caregivers um, and, and that factors into their decision as well. Great, thank you very much for that answer. And actually uh, one of the activities that we were busy with last year uh, was exactly based on the regulatory agency's recommendation is to have a, a voice of the patient meeting where uh, our community really showed up in full force and um, uh, gave testimonials which we combine into a report that the FDA has now describing what the disease burden is and what the community is looking for in a treatment. Yeah, um, um, and I, I know that, I mean, like for instance, I do um, a lot of Pompe disease and, and there are two new drugs that have shown benefit and they're going uh, up in front of the FDA. Um, and and the, so the patient testimonials are gonna be important because they, they want, FDA wants to know uh, that in addition, in addition to the statistical benefit that the company may be showing them, how are the patients doing? What, what, has, what has the drug done for them in terms of day-to-day -day activities of living? Are there things that they can do better that they were not able to do better? Okay, has it made their life easier? And, that, and those are important testimonials. It's a real life um, real example. Life yeah, exactly. exactly, yeah. Wonderful. Um, I don't wanna be dominating all of the questions. Uh, uh, Beth, did you have anything to add? Um, I know we're running short on time. We're I didn't get through close, all the questions. Yeah. We're getting close to our hour, but there are a couple of questions in here I think that um, would be relevant. Um, Alice asks, depending on the fulcrum outcome, is it possible that enrollment would reopen for a larger group? Well, I mean, th and that's what I that's what I remarked about. It's uh, it, to me, and and I could be wrong on, um, on that. I, again, depending on what the phase two data shows, if the phase two data is, is outstanding, then a full camp may potentially attempt to get approval based on phase two data alone. In all likelihood, there will be a phase three study, and a phase three study is a much larger study, so there will be a larger cohort of patients. They probably will have to include many more centers and many more centers across the world because most drug companies will want to get approval in Europe. They will want to get approval in, they have to do a separate study in Japan because the Japanese population behaves differently when it comes to drug metabolism and that. So they probably will be a phase three study with a much larger number of patients um, and many more centers across the world. Um, and along those same lines, Roy asks, um, because FSHD is considered a rare disease, um, would a single phase three test be required? And it seems, sounds like that's what you just recommended. Is that- Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. And that applies for rare and ultra rare diseases. The FDA's threshold 
is you only require one well done, well designed phase three study to seek approval. Good. And of course, everyone's question <laughs> is when. So if it's approved, you know, when would the treatments um, actually get to families and be available? Mm -hmm. um, I guess maybe what is the best case scenario for patients to get access to therapy at that point? So again, um, I, and I, I noticed there were a bunch of questions about the COVID vaccine. This is a different situation. Okay, so this is not a public health emergency. Uh, a lot of the acceleration of the COVID approvals were because of the public health emergency um, aspect of it. It was really a crisis. It was a global crisis. Um, so they, the FDA really prioritized and approved um, things much faster for COVID than they are likely to do for any other diseases on that. So I can give you a ballpark figure. So let's say, let's assume for a second that the um, drug study, the phase three study is remarkably positive and the company chooses and decides to go and seek approval from the FDA. Normally it takes anywhere from six to nine months for them to come clean out the data, um, get a package ready um, before they can present the data in front of the FDA. So I, I can tell you from more recent Pompeii studies and other studies, it's taking about nine months to a year for them to get what's called a PADUFA date, which is the drug approval date from the FDA, the, the, the meeting date from the FDA, where the FDA will consider approving the drug on that. So that, that's about how long it takes um, for, from a time that you have a positive study result to the time that they actually show up in front of the FDA to present their case. Now, let's say that the first PADUFA meeting is successful and the FDA decides to approve the drug that day. It still will take about six months for the drug to get on the market because you have to work with the insurance companies to get the drug approved. You have to get it approved by Medicare, by Medi-Cal um, or Medicaid. Um, you have to get it on the panel for the VA and other things. And then you have to figure out the distribution, the marketing of the drug, all of those things. Okay, so so it even after a study shows a benefit, it may take about anywhere from fourteen to eighteen months for the drug to be actually available by prescription. Wow. Okay, so we have our work cut out for us, don't we? <laughs> Excellent. Well. Um, Honestly, you have done an amazing job um, answering so many questions for us, Dr. Mozafar. So are there any last um, bits of information you'd like to share or um, uh, anything that, uh, final words that you'd like to say? Well, I mean, I, I think I, I saw a couple of questions about the age limit and about the um, duration of the disease. And, and I, I think those are very important questions. So the duration of the disease is an important issue because the longer the patient has disease, the likelihood is that more and more of the muscle is getting replaced by fat. Um, so that, and that's why I mentioned that in usually in clinical trials, they limit the eligibility to patients who are relatively newer onset of within the first five or 10 years of the study on that. The drug may still work and every patient is different. And you, you know, um, as an FSH patient, that there's significant variability even within FSH and within FSH families. So you may have family members who are very severely affected and you have family members who are mildly affected. So there is, we know there's a lot of issues with penetrance of the drug disease, but it really depends on how much methylation you have in the muscle, et cetera, on that. So th there's no reason to believe that the drug may not work in more involved or most um, patients with longer duration on that. Um, same question goes up to um, for the patients who are above the age of 65 or the patients who are less than 18 years of age. There's no reason to suspect the drug may not work. Most clinical trials, unless there is a dominant portion in the pediatric population, will try to avoid taking pediatric patients because the burden is much higher. Uh, the safety burdens are much higher. And same thing with 65 and older because they have many more other confounding diseases, they may have diabetes, they may have heart conditions, they may have had strokes. So that's why a lot of the drug trials try to minimize inclusion of patients above a certain age. That doesn't mean that the drug may not work. 
uh, and that drug cannot be given to individuals above the age of 65. But from a phase three study point of view, they probably still will limit the eligibility to patients uh, under the age of 70, usually. And as um, one doctor um, always seen, said to us, um, we all have a muscle wasting disease, it's called age. And so yes. once you get above a certain age, you know, you don't know if the muscle wasting is due to your age or due to, you know, the disease burden. So that's, a, that's an incredibly important point. So uh, because as we get older, unfortunately, our muscles don't do as well. Right. Great. That's my excuse. That's what I blame it. <laughs> Jamsheed, any other final points or any other questions for Dr. Mozafar? June, any other final questions? I think this was an incredibly useful and very informative session. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a really amazing to not get distracted with slides and, and just hear from you, your experience uh, on what clinical trials look like, how they're designed and, um, and, and extrapolate on, uh, onto what might come out from this upcoming trial from uh, Fulcrum study. So uh, thank you very much. No problem, and I, it's time. my pleasure. And I apologize again that I, I, I was having too much of a fun in Hawaii, so I didn't get a chance to make any slides. <laughs> no, 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 actually, this was this, this actually I thought worked out really, really well, and um, uh, and and you had a lot of information to share, so that that was fantastic. And, and then I, I I I want to emphasize again that I'm really really excited and looking forward to the results. Um, this is an incredibly exciting time in neuromuscular disease where we have so many options available and so many new treatments coming along the pipeline. So I, I have, I wake up happy every morning and look forward to working every day. Oh, I, I like to hear that. I like to hear that. Um, well, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending our FSHD University webinar today. Of course, a very special thank you to um, the amazing Dr. Mozafar and our wonderful Chief Science Officer Jamshid Arjaman. Um, for answering all of these crazy, crazy questions. There are so many going around our community right now, as you can imagine. Um, our next FSHD webinar uh, is next, or not next Thursday, is Thursday, July the 15th. It's at the same time, one o'clock Eastern. Our guest speaker is Dr. Nikia Stinson, and the topic is gonna be dynamic sitting. So please join us next month. Um, and also just, of course, visit our website event calendar for all of the upcoming chapter, wellness, education events. There's so many wonderful things coming up, including our signature international walk and roll to cure FSHD fundraising event in September. So just check the website to join a walk and roll that's closest to you and be a part of the solution. Again, thank you so much for joining us today and we will see you next time. Thank you everyone. Take care. Take care.